There is one thing we all need to know. Amidst the trials, tribulations, and vicissitudes of this life. And that is that God, the Heavenly Father, is always very close and nearby. And that you can always talk to him about whatever troubles bothers or grieves you. He is not in some far away place called heaven. He's not a vast and inscrutable character, but he's a nearby loving heavenly father, and he is nearer to you, really, than you are to yourself. He's right there. He's right here. He's right wherever you are at any time. Now, I have a farm in the country in Dutchess County, and we live in a house that was built in 1825, though it's been spruced up and modernized some since then. And we have a modern electrical system, naturally. But I was sitting in my study the other day, working on this sermon, and the ideas weren't flowing very well, as you will presently discover. <laughs> and I got to looking out the window both ways, and at the ceiling, and wherever. And my eyes got fixed on an electrical fixture, a wall bracket, which is very old-fashioned in nature. Now, we have table lamps. But I got to thinking, I have never seen that wall bracket turned on. And we've lived in this house for 16 years. Never have I turned it on. So I wondered what would happen if I did. I got up and thinking negative thoughts about electric light bulbs, I turned it on and instantly the room was flooded by brilliant light. So I sat back in my chair and I said, if you can get an electric light that you've neglected for all these years merely by the turning of a little screw. Why can't you turn God on in your life by the turning of a thought? And then I remembered a poem Speak to him thou, for he hears, and spirit with spirit can meet. Nearer is he than breathing, closer than hands and feet. So this is to tell you, or remind you, that if the going is difficult and hard at any time, you turn, turn your mind just a little, and he will come in. He's close enough to talk to. Then I remembered a circumstance of a number of years ago where when I was attending the Rotary Club of New York at one of its noonday meetings, of which I'm a member, and there was a man at the table for 10, whom I had known a long while. And he said to me, I'm having a rough time, fellas. And they all showed sympathy. And he told us 
about what was happening to him and how hard it all was. And we all told him we'd think about him. Some of us told him we'd pray for him. After the meeting was over, he stopped me on my way out and he said, look, I want to ask you a question. You are a Christian and so am I. You are a member of a church and so am I. And we've both been brought up to be believers, haven't we? And I said, yes, sir. Well, said he, do you actually 100% believe that Jesus Christ is alive and that he is here now? I said, Jim, I absolutely believe that Jesus Christ is alive and that he is here now and that he is actually with the two of us because the Bible says that where any two agree is touching any matter, your heavenly father is right there to help you. Well, he said, I, I, can't, I can't meet what I've got to deal with. What should I do? Well, I said, if I were you, I would talk to Jesus about it. Well, he said, you know, he, he's not around. And I said, yes, he is. You talk to him and you tell him that you believe he's here and that he's listening to you and that he's interested in you and you will have a wonderful demonstration that he is with him. I said, go out and take a walk at night. Get out of your house. Walk under the stars or in the snow or in the rain or whatever and just talk to him. Some days later, he came up to me at another meeting and he said, that really worked. And I noticed that tears stood in his eyes. He said, I live outside the city in a suburban place and he mentioned it and I went out several nights walking like you said and it was rainy this night and very misty and all of a sudden as I walked along I heard footsteps I did for sure but I looked around and there was no one in sight and then I felt a presence and I heard a voice. Now I said, did you hear a voice? He said, I seem to hear a voice saying to me, don't worry so much. I'm with you and I will help you. And then he said, the problems that I had seemed gradually to unfold. And I got my answer. So he said, don't you tell me that Jesus Christ isn't near to me. I said, I never told you that. I told you that he was. Now, you know, I can imagine what some atheist or somebody would say about what I'm giving you here. Or some uh, immature scientist the mature scientists would agree with me. But the small fry, you know, who got to, <laughs> got to appear uh, super intellectual. But I've got a clipping here in my hand from the Tampa, Florida Tribune of Saturday, August 23rd, 1980. O'Hare's son says atheists in trouble. William Murray, son of atheist Madeline Murray O'Hare, says miracles have happened in his life since he denounced atheism and gave his life to God. He's quoted as saying his mother's organizations nearly destroyed me. At age 16, Murray was the plaintiff in the mother's court fight that resulted in the U.S. Supreme Court ban on state-mandated public school prayer. He says his mother's organization is in trouble. If I headed an atheist movement for 20 years 
And all the members I could get in all that time are 1,240 throughout the entire nation. I'd look around for another job. <laughs> Why, that is pathetic. All the hullabaloo, all the bombast, even getting the attention of the United States Supreme Court, and all they've got is 1,240 members in the whole United States. How many people are there in the United States? I don't know. Even the Census Bureau doesn't seem to know. <laughs> but only 1,240 atheists. <laughs> and we used to be worried about atheism are going to take us over after a while. In 1975, he says, he responded to his mother's request for help in managing her organization, which was faltering and failing. Two years later, I was a nervous wreck. He says the attitude of atheism is so negative, it causes a negative reaction. It makes you sick. So he began searching for meaning in his life, thinking surely there has to be something better than this. My self-search for communion and meaning brought me to my knees. And since then, there have been miracles in my life. I decided it was time that my wife and I got our unborn child out of there. That was almost three years ago. He says he spent two years trying to recover from the negative world that had consumed him. It is miraculous, he said, what God can do in lives through faith. The Lord moves in miraculous ways. So says the son of the leading atheist of our time. Don't you ever worry about Jesus Christ not coming into his own and staying there. He is the greatest thinker of all the ages that have ever passed, and this age too. And you can speak to him. There was a man named Cleopas and another who was walking down a road outside of Jerusalem one time when they met a strangely gifted stranger. And his conversation was fascinating beyond all description. And finally, they stopped at a little place and they asked him to come in and have supper with them. And they didn't know him, but he took his strong brown hands and he held a piece of a loaf of nut brown bread and he broke it. And they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. And later on they said, did not our hearts feel strangely warm within us? while we talked with him, by the way. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And if they could talk to him, so can you. And in the 34th Psalm it said, I sought the Lord and he heard me. And when he hears you, he speaks with you. And then one of the greatest passages in the Bible is about Moses. And hey, Moses must have been a great character. Rugged, big old fellow. There's a statue of him by Michelangelo somewhere I saw in Italy. Florence, I guess. Or maybe Rome. Or it doesn't make any difference. I saw it someplace. And here he is, a great, big old fellow. And the Bible says, <laughs> And Moses spoke unto the Lord face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. Now, of course, when we speak to the Lord, we get down on our knees or we bow and we shut our eyes. And that's to show reverence. 
But I don't know but what this is better. Because the God we're talking to is a father. He's a great, big, loving father. And he'd like to look his children in the eye once in a while, at least. And Moses spoke unto the Lord face to face. As a man speaketh unto his friend. Well, you see, when crisis comes, what a wonderful thing it is to know that you can talk to him. And if you talk to him, you can get an answer in any crisis. Speak to him as Moses did, face to face. I happen to have a radio program called The American Character. It's only 90 seconds long. And we have about 330 stations. And we have a staff of writers, and they produce these beautiful stories. All I have to do is read them over the air. And the, and the one, they had one the other day that represented a crisis situation in which a man got an answer. This man's name was George Froman. And he was at Glacier National Park in front of the lodge there. There was a little six-year-old boy named Kevin Adach. And Kevin was a lively kid. Then there was a door of plate glass from ceiling to ground. A door to the lodge. But apparently it was so clean that it looked like there was no door there. And Kevin, at a high rate of speed, ran against this door, smashed it, great shards of glass raining about him, and he was cut in several places. And he tumbled face forward through the door and George Froman ran to assist him and he saw that the little boy was bleeding profusely the jugular vein had been cut and Froman knew that unless something were accomplished in a minute this little boy would bleed to death Froman 30 years before had been a boy scout and he was taught the methodology to stop bleeding, breeding, bleeding, but he couldn't remember it. So in an instant, with intensity of belief and urgency of purpose, he said, dear Jesus Christ, tell me what to do with this boy. And immediately he sensed a presence and there, as clear as it had been read by him when he was a boy himself, he read the Boy Scout method to stop bleeding. So he reached for the little boy's neck and got his thumb just so. And the bleeding stopped. And he maintained that position for what he said certainly must have been a half hour but was only a few moments till the paramedics arrived and took over. And they stated that unless Froman had known absolutely instinctively what to do, this life would have been lost. Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever he's near to you with all of his wisdom, his know-how, his infinite knowledge, his magnificent strength to help you at all times. In the crisis, he's there. 
I was in the Toronto airport not long ago on my way to make a speech in a Canadian city. And a man walked up to me and he says, are you from New York City? I said, yes, sir. Where are you from? Well, he said, I used to be from New York, but I'm not from there anymore. I'm someplace else in Canada. He said, don't I know you? I said, I wouldn't have the slightest idea. But if you knew me, you wouldn't have to be asking me whether you knew me or not. <laughs> well, he said, I have seen you somewhere. Well, I said, I don't remember ever having seen you in my life. Well, he said, I've seen you. He said, are you a minister of a church? And I said, yes, sir. He says, in New York City? I said, yes, sir. Oh, he said, I know now. You're Dr. Peel. I said, yes, sir. No, he said, I don't know whether you are or not. <laughs> I said, why don't you know whether I am or not? He said, because you don't look like him exactly. I said, what is the difference between him and me? He said, well, he's better looking than you are. <laughs> or some such uh, stupid remark as that. <laughs> Finally, we got around to the fact that we knew each other. Well, he said, I didn't know you, but I knew one of your associates. He said, I knew Dr. Smiley Blanton, the psychiatrist. We had a psychiatrist work with us here at one time named Smiley Blanton. He was, for example, the greatest uh, authority on stuttering in the United States. He was once a professor of that subject at the University of Wisconsin. He studied uh, abroad with Freud, and he was in the College of Physicians and Surgeons in London. He was one of the most highly trained psychiatrists in the history of our time. And uh, this man, and he was on our staff here until the time of his death at 85 years of age. One of the greatest human beings I've ever known. So this man said he went to see Smiley. He had repeated counseling sessions with him. He said, I was filled with fear. I was mixed up. I had all kinds of infantile mental uh, aberrations. And the psychiatrist gave me all kinds of treatments. But I never got any better. Until one day, Smiley Blanton, who was a dyed-in-the-wool deep south southerner and always talked that way, said to him, listen, son, I have given you all the scientific knowledge that I possess. And I haven't gotten anywhere with you. Tell you what you do. Tell me something. Do you believe in Jesus? And the man said, yes. Well said, smiling. You go and talk to Jesus, and he will straighten you out. And then you just believe what he says and go and do that way. And you'll become a healthy man. Now, here's one of the greatest psychiatric scientists of our national history becoming so simple as to tell a patient to go to the greatest physician who ever lived, and he would be made well. And I said to him, how are you now? He said, I have peace and quietness and happiness in my heart like never before. I say to you, take your problems to Jesus and tell him about it. 
and listen, and he'll give you the answer that you need, for he's right there to talk to. Our Heavenly Father, it's time we stopped talking and time we started listening to that voice, melodic, strong, sympathetic, loving, which tells us that by following him in all things, our lives will reveal victory and strength. And for this we give you thanks, through Christ our Lord. Amen.